Professor Dave and Chegg here. Everyone has seen this before. It's the periodic table of the elements. It displays all the elements in an organized way according to their properties. But why is it organized this specific way and how did this organization come about? Let's get an introduction to the periodic table and its history. In the mid-19th century, chemists were working to purify different metal ores, and in the process they discovered several new elements. There was much effort put forth towards organizing all the known elements into a table that could explain their properties. For example, lithium, sodium, and potassium are all shiny metals that conduct heat and electricity and react with oxygen atoms in a 2 to 1 ratio. Calcium, strontium, and barium also have similar properties to one another and react with oxygen atoms in a 1 to 1 ratio. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine were shown to have similar properties. A number of chemists used all of this data to arrange the elements in a particular way, according to periodic relationships, or characteristics that are recurring every certain number of elements. There were certain associations that all chemists were able to agree upon, but different chemists had different opinions as to how the table should be organized as a whole to offer the most predictive power. Among numerous configurations that were proposed, the one offered by Dmitry Mendeleev was the most successful, and the table we use today is based on his work. Although other formats also organized the elements by increasing atomic mass in a way that highlighted the periodic relationship of some of these recorded properties, Mendeleev went one step further. Because there were empty spots in different locations, his table also made predictions about the existence of as-of-yet undiscovered elements on the basis of the groups they would necessarily belong to. Gallium was discovered in 1875 and was shown to have properties similar to aluminum, just as Mendeleev predicted on the basis that there was an empty spot under aluminum on his periodic table. Germanium, discovered in 1886, also matched the predictions of the table when it was found to have properties similar to silicon, which had an empty spot underneath it as well. Because elements were discovered and were found to have precisely the properties that Mendeleev predicted, this was strong evidence that his periodic table had a firm basis in the structure of these elements. It was still some time before we understood the reasons behind the periodicity of these properties, but this was a big step in our chemical understanding nonetheless. So here is the periodic table as it is today. On this table, each box represents an element, and these elements are arranged into rows, which are called periods. This is how we display the periodicity of properties, because with the start of each new row, we start again with a new repetition of these shared properties that the elements tend to exhibit. That means that elements in the same column, or group, are the ones that will display similar behavior. There are seven periods and 18 groups. It used to be the case that the groups were numbered 1 through 8, using Roman numerals and skipping over the section in the middle, but now it is more typical that we use the numerical symbols we see here. In order to save space, a section of the table is removed and placed below the rest. These are the lanthanides and actinides, and they would technically belong in this area. Because of the way the elements are arranged, it was realized that the elements could be described as being either metals, metalloids, or nonmetals, and these different types of elements have a tendency to display particular properties that will be discussed later. As you can see, metals take up the majority of the table, with nonmetals relegated to the upper right section of the table, and metalloids form this diagonal section containing elements that exhibit intermediary properties between metals and nonmetals. Various quantitative information about a particular element is listed in the relevant block. First, we can see the chemical symbol of the element. This will have either one or two letters and is unique to that element. We don't need to memorize all of these, but it is a good idea to slowly become familiar with the chemical symbols for the common elements so that we can quickly locate them on the periodic table. Next, we will certainly notice the atomic number. This refers to the number of protons in an atom, and this is what defines the element. One proton corresponds to hydrogen, two to helium, and so forth. Then there is the atomic mass, which is the average mass of all the isotopes of that element with respect to their relative abundance. That's why the atomic masses are not integer values, as mass numbers must be, which correspond to a specific number of protons and neutrons in a particular nucleus.
When looking at an element as a whole, we are talking about the average mass of an atom in a sample of that element, which will depend on the relative abundance of the different isotopes. The key to understanding the periodicity of the elements is identifying what group each element belongs to. As we mentioned, it is the group that an element belongs to that determines so many of its physical and chemical characteristics, which is the basis for the organization of the periodic table in the first place. Apart from categorizing elements as being either metals, metalloids, or nonmetals, we should also be able to name several of the groups and know a bit about the behavior they imply. Group 1 is called the alkali metals. These include lithium, sodium, all the way down to francium. These elements are shiny metals that conduct heat and electricity and react with oxygen atoms in a 2 to 1 ratio. Group 2 is called the alkaline earth metals. These range from beryllium to radium and will share similar metallic properties, though they will react with oxygen in a 1 to 1 ratio. This section of the table is called the transition metals, many of which have similar chemical properties, such as the ease with which they are oxidized. And the groups below the table, which are meant to fit in between group 2 and the transition metals, are called the lanthanides and actinides. Many of these are quite rare, and some do not even occur naturally, so we do not discuss them frequently, except maybe uranium from time to time. Moving to some of the more familiar elements, group 15 is called the nictogens, including nitrogen and phosphorus, which are common elements with similar reactivity. Group 16 is called the chalcogens, including oxygen and sulfur. Group 17 is called the halogens. This includes fluorine and chlorine, which also react similarly. Lastly, group 18 is called the noble gases, beginning with helium and neon, all the way down to radon and oganesson. These are also known as the inert gases, because the similar reactivity that they display is that, with just a few exceptions, they essentially do not react with anything, even themselves, which is why inert gases are monoatomic species. That concludes an introduction to the periodic table. Now that we know a little bit about its history and precisely why it is organized this way, so as to put elements that behave similarly into groups, we should have a better understanding of the table and the way it characterizes the elements in terms of their properties. Professor Dave for Chegg. See you next time.